Welcome to the San Mateo County Planning Commission meeting of May 12, 2021. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, may we have roll call, please? Commissioner Gupta? Here. Commissioner Santa Cruz? Aye. Commissioner Hansen? Here. Commissioner Ramirez? Here. Chair Ketchum? Here. And staff is represented by Monowitz, Fox, and Montes. Okay, next on the agenda is oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public <clears throat> to speak on any subject that is not on today's agenda. Speakers will be limited to five minutes. First staff will explain how the public comment process works for our remote meeting. Thank you, Chair. For those, for those attending the meeting on the Zoom video conference, we will use the raised hand feature in order to organize any public comments. During the general public comment period, <clears throat> and for each item on the regular agenda, I will ask those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raised hand feature to raise your hand to speak on that agenda item. For those joining by phone, please press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. Please note that members of the public must wait with my prompt in connection with each agenda item before using the raised hand function. For example, you cannot raise your hand at the beginning of the meeting for an agenda that is later in the meeting. When you hear your name called, I will prompt you to unmute your account and you may begin speaking. So right now, I do not see anyone with their hand raised here. So we'll wait just a minute. Seeing no requests to speak, we will close oral communications and move on to the consent agenda. Both items on consent have been postponed to our next meeting. So we now move on to the regular agenda Staff will introduce the one item. Thank you, Chair. Um, really quickly. Mike, can you put your um, presentation on the wall? One sec. Um, where do you go? There it is. How's that? Perfect. Item number one, applicant, San Mateo Resource Conservation District. Owner, Peninsula Open Space Trust, host, file number PLN 2021-00010. The location is under undeveloped farmland one mile south of the town of Pescadero, and the project planner is Mike Schaller. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, as Janth just mentioned, the project before you today is um, a request by the Resource Conservation District. Um, why is that not working? Um, hold on a second. You can try using the arrows instead of the clicker is not working. There we go. I was pushing the wrong arrow. Okay. Um, the project before you is a request by the San Mateo Resource Conservation District to construct a habitat enhancement project for the San Francisco garter snake. The project site is located approximately um, 0.8 of a mile south of the town of Pescadero. Uh, the nearest buildings uh, would be the Oku Farms greenhouse complex, which you see right here. Um, this is approximately 1500 feet to the southeast of the project site. Um, the, the site itself is not visible from really any public access, uh, public road. Uh, it's shielded by these intervening hills. Um, uh, to the north and east of, uh, of the project site. The project parcel itself is approximately 122 acres in size, but the area that is subject to the application uh, is just this small area at the south end of the parcel within the red circle. The project site sits within an intermittent tributary of Butino Creek. <clears throat> Uh, the project consists of several key components. The, the first step in the project would be the removal of vegetation. Um, this will involve uh, removal primarily of, of willows and tules from the eastern portion of the pond uh, in this area around here. 
and extending up uh, to the upper reaches of the very, what's now pretty much a totally silted in pond um, to perform the proposed grading. Additionally, the applicant is proposing to remove willow trees in this area in the Northwest uh, quadrant um, of the site. This is intent intended to allow for the reestablishment of grassland habitat in this area and provide a mix of vegetation areas for the garter snake and the California red-legged frog. Once the vegetation has been removed, accumulated sediment in the eastern end of the pond will be excavated to create a deep water area with a depth of three to seven feet, that would be here in the blue, as well as a shallower bench area around the deep water, which is kind of the periphery of this, of the deeper uh, area. Uh, that shallower bench area will be about 10 to 20 inches in depth. Um, additionally, two new shallow ponds um, will be constructed here. Um, these new ponds will be seasonal and have depths of 10 to 20 inches as well, providing shallow water habitat for the California red-legged frog and Sierra tree frogs, uh, both food sources for the garter snake. Also berms will be constructed from material removed the, from the pond and placed in the area between the new shallower ponds. Um, these constructed berms will function to slow the flow of water moving through the floodplain and allow sediment to fall out prior to, re to the water reaching the, the main pond itself. The berms will ultimately build up the elevation of the inlet channel and provide natural grade control to avoid head cutting and minimize future erosion in, the, in this gully area uh, here to the east of the, of the site. The remaining half acre of existing pond habitat will remain unaltered. So this area right, right around here um, and maintained into the future. The current conditions at this location contain a dense mix of tules and cattails, which help filter sediment from the drainage before it enters uh, Butino Creek, which is down here. In addition to the pond construction work, the project also proposes to enhance approximately 61 acres of upland habitat for the garter snake. This includes brush removal and grassland restoration to enhance basking habitat for, for the garter snake. Wood chips from the tree and brush removal activities will be used as mulch and spread across the upland areas. Finally, fencing will be installed to control livestock access to portions of the restored upland habitat. Uh, I'd like to point out that the, it is the intention of both the property owner and the RCD to continue to allow cattle grazing on the, the overall project, uh, project parcel, but obviously they want to limit access in certain areas uh, initially so to allow the vegetation, the desired vegetation to grow back and, and um, thrive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as discussed in your staff report, Fish and wildlife management activities are permitted use in both riparian and wetland habitat areas under the LCP. In this instance, the temporary impacts to the sensitive habitat areas in and around the project site will be offset by the increased and enhanced habitat that will be created for both, <coughs> excuse me, the San Francisco garter snake and the California red-legged frog, both of which are endangered species. The applicant for this project, the RCD, has worked closely with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the design and implementation of this project. The design and implement, implementation measures contained in the applicant's materials comply with the performance standards policies contained in the LCP. The proposed mitigation measures contained in the project's CEQA document have also been included as conditions of approval in attachment A of your staff report. Uh, so in closing, staff is recommending approval of this project subject to the required findings and conditions of approval identified in attachment A of your report. Are there any questions I can answer for the commissioners at this time? Uh, thank you for your report. Uh, Commissioner Ramirez, would you like to start us off? Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, it, it was never really clear to me um, if... Uh, if the, the main reason for doing this rehabilitation uh, of the area was it to enhance uh, more of the cattle uh, racing, uh, grazing in, in the area, or is it exclusively to enhance the, uh, 
the areas for the protective species um, or one or do both kind of uh, tied together? I mean, uh, well, they are um, tied together to a certain extent. Um, as I mentioned, the, it is the intention of the RCD and, and the property owner post to continue to allow some access to the existing pond uh, for cattle. Uh, but primarily their, their intention is, uh, their hope is to can, uh, be able to siphon water out of the, the pond and into uh, a series of troughs that would allow the cattle to get water, but without having to trample through the pond. But the primary intended focus of the project is habitat enhancement for the garter snake and the red-legged frog. Um, it's, uh, this project, um, is a bit of a, it, it's, the, the RCD has, uh, the RCD working in conjunction with other um, state and federal agencies identified um, a number of habitat enhancement projects throughout the Butino corridor or Butino Creek mm -hmm. corridor, I should say, uh, as part of the work that the RCD has been spearheading with um, rehab rehabilitation of, of the floodplain and the, and the, 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 water carrying capacity of Butino Creek to avoid flooding and also the work that um, they spearheaded in Pescadero Marsh. Um, the, the money, so to speak, uh, for this project is coming from PG&E and it's um, required mitigation by, uh, by PG&E for a project they have on the bay side of, of the county um, where they're impacting um, identified fish and frog habitat uh, over on uh, in uh, Belmont area, if I remember correctly. Um, the opportunities to do restoration work at that location are not uh, really aren't viable. Uh, so PG&E is essentially funding this project that the RCD had uh, been spearheading and had already identified as a as a an important project for um, trying to bring back the fish and the fish, I'm sorry, the frog and snake populations. Okay, so w once this uh, restoration is done, then um, would you say that then um, the conflict between uh, cattle grazing and, uh, and the protected species will be better uh, separated from each other so that they don't conflict with that, each other? That's my, under, that's my understanding from reviewing the, um, the, the materials that were submitted as part of the application, yes. Um, it's okay. not the desire of the property owner or of the RCD to exclude um, cattle grazing on the site, um, just in this very, you know, relatively specific area. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. I'm going to add to that. I mean, um, I think the conflict is really with the um, aquatic habitat area where we want to minimize trampling. The um, use of the site for active grazing can have beneficial impacts for the species of concern um, in that they can, the hooves of the cows can create depressions and burrows that, which are subsequently used by the snakes and so forth. So um, I, I think that, you know, uh, the two are not necessarily in conflict. And I think that this project shows how to effectively manage the grazing such that they can coexist in a benefit, beneficial way. Okay, uh, well, that, that triggers another question. I mean, um, there is no conflict with the, you know, cattle trampling uh, some of these animals? Well, I think um, effective management of grazing operation is critical. And um, I, I, I think there is, the potential for conflict if that's not done. Um, mm -hmm. Could a cow step on a snake or a frog? Maybe, um, I don't know if, uh, and the RCD will probably speak to that, but I think in general, the presence of uh, grazing animals um, in the vicinity of this habitat is a good thing. But yeah, okay, all right, that's fine. No, no additional questions at the moment. Commissioner Santa Cruz. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to ask a question um, regarding the gathered snake. The project, is it done because 
these gutter snakes are in extinction or just a, a matter of coexistence with the with the rest of the habitat around them? Uh, well, the San Francisco's garter snake is a federally listed endangered species, um, mm -hmm. as is the California red-legged frog. Um, and both are known to occur within the Butino Creek um, habitat uh, channel in which, and um, they, have been known, they have been identified at least at times in and around this pond area. Okay, and then I know that Butano Park is um, has some hiking trails and driving campsite and walking campsite. Are these uh, 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 ponds in away from from those uh, uh, areas or or? Uh, uh, or yes, uh, Butano State Park is probably about I would say four about four miles, three and a half to four miles to the south east of the project site. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Gupta. Um, Commissioner Gupta, have we lost you? No, no, no I was just muted. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, uh, some of the questions have already been answered, but um, yeah, I, I looked up a little bit about the uh, snakes. You know, snakes mm -hmm. don't give you a feeling of comfort <laughs> when you, <laughs> even when you read about them. Uh, so, uh, so, so the cattle, uh, I, I'm still trying to wrap my arms around it, is the cattle and the snakes they don't kind of um, interfere with each other in any way, um, or the, and there's no way of separating them. I assume. Well, there's partial separation with this project. I mean, keeping the cows, minimizing their entry points into the pond will um, go a long way in addressing that. But I think um, overall is, as you heard, part of the project is enhancing the grasslands and um, the ability of grasslands to survive and thrive in the past has been partly dependent on the presence of grazing animals. So before there were cows, there were antelope and other types of grazers present and those um, those grazing animals um, helped establish what became, you know, the natural ecology of the area. And um, so while cows aren't antelopes, they provide some of the similar benefits that um, the grazing animals that used to exist here provide by keeping the grasslands free of the scrub and other vegetation that would um, overtake them among other ways. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. The, I'm getting some some feel for that. Uh, so when uh, animals are grazing, at that time they are not. Uh, there may not be snakes in that area, or are, is that dense uh, vegetation kind of thinned out? Um, so that uh, you, you see what my question is. I'm still concerned that on one hand, we are trying to, uh, or the snakes are uh, uh, endangered species. So we don't want them um, being either stampeded or killed by the grazing. That's right. And I think um, this discussion um, supports the commission's desire to get in the field and see some of the projects that have been done in our county because I've had the benefit of such opportunities before where mm -hmm. I've seen how restoration projects um, on land that is used being for active grazing um, can really be a good thing for the animals and lead to an increase in population. Um, now, I, I can't um, 
eliminate the possibility of potential trampling. I think those occasions are likely to be few and far between and that the overall benefits of this mutualistic relationship is um, better. I think when uh, some of the things I've learned from my various field um, visits and speaking to the professionals is that um, you know, one of the worst things to do is just fence an area off and leave it unmanaged because, um, you know, that's when the invasive species come in and take over. Um, that's when we get serious fire hazard buildup. Um, and I think when it comes to resource management, it necessitates some active management by the landowner to, you know, protect and conserve the species. And, um, you know, I, I think that the resource conservation district is, has, um, that in mind and they have the scientific knowledge and expertise and assistance to ensure that these projects are carried out in a manner that is going to be protective of the resources. So um, I, I, I'm very confident in the work that they've put into this to ensure that the species will benefit. Um, so, so when was the last time uh, anything was done in this area in terms of managing, managing the growth and uh, and the uh, ponds and whatever. I'm afraid I I'm afraid there was no no, no information okay. to that um, that question in any of the materials submitted by the by the applicant. Um, but it, it a while um, clearly the the establishment of some of the the vegetation around the pond. Um, given the amount there, it, it's been a long time since it's really been actively managed. And, and particularly uh, when you look at the, the spread of coyote brush on the upper outer edges of the pond of the, of the area, um, it's a real giveaway that uh, it hasn't been actively, um, it, that the cattle haven't necessarily been allowed to get in there and, and keep the coyote brush and other uh, shrub species down, which is one of the benefits of cattle grazing is that it, it prevents those types of, of species from taking over um, the taking over the landscape. Okay. okay. Um, so once this is done, uh, who maintains it? Uh, well, the, the property is owned by post. Mm -hmm. And so they will be responsible uh, for maintaining the site. Um, I'm sure the RCD will work in conjunction with them in terms of a management plan, uh, or there is already a management plan that they've, a conceptual management plan they have in place. But um, in terms of just the implementation of that management plan, it'll be uh, the responsibility of the property owner, which is post. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, I, I had a question about how is it being funded, but you already mentioned that uh, PG&E uh, is, is funding this project. Yes. Correct? Right. That's correct, okay. yes. Okay. Thank you. No, no further questions at this time. Commissioner Hanson. Thank you. And good morning. Um, first, uh, thank you for the administrative report. It was long, lengthy, thorough, to the point that I've actually used it for other things that are not related to planning. Um, it had a lot of great information. And that begged the question, when I was thinking about it and wondering what questions to ask, is I really can't understand why this is in front of us. I mean, wh why is this in front of us? Why wasn't this handled administratively? Why was, why couldn't this have been fast track? Uh, this to me almost looked like something that's more like a mitigation project for, for something that was big and complex. I mean, we, in my mind, we can ask you questions all the time. We can't even say hello to each other under a half hour. And we love reviewing things and asking lots of good questions. But at the same time, you know, I don't want to hold up an applicant that it would be required to do this anyway, if they're just trying to put a water pump in or something, you know, I, 
my really question is, you know, why wasn't this handled administratively and why is this in front of us and that needs me something to really to review? Um, so uh, to ask, well, and I'm sure Steve can weigh in as well, but it it is, it does meet the definition of development um, under the Coastal Act, which is also contained in our own LCP. So, um, uh, and there are no exemptions for um, for work within riparian and wetland areas. Um, I do just I do agree with you that um, this is a great project and it's it's something that obviously we encourage uh, and the LCP uh, encourages as well. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there's there's no way to to avoid having to issue a C, um, a CDP for it. Well, uh, let, me, let me just add to that. Um, you're right under current circumstances, Mike. Um, it's development. There's no exemption for it. And um, when you have development within a, the vicinity of a sensitive habitat, it makes it appealable to the Coastal Commission. And when the project is appealable to the Coastal Commission, it necessitates a public hearing by regulation. So, um, you, uh, Commissioner Hansom, your, your comments, I'm sure, are music to the RCD's ears because um, we talk about this quite a bit. Um, you know, both CEQA, the need to, for environmental review for projects that really are a benefit to the environment, and then the whole permitting process. And we are actively pursuing methods to streamline and exempt these projects. Um, one of the methods we do that by is by asking the um, conservation districts or special districts that will be doing this these types of restoration projects to kind of put together a master plan. And let's take care of, you know, your next five years of restoration activities at one hearing so that you don't, we don't have to do one for each, right? That, that can be difficult, I think, on the resource agencies to predict that out out that far, um, but it has been used in some instances. The other thing is where we can partner with federal agencies. Um, the federal government is exempt from um, coastal permit requirements and they go straight through the Coastal Commission directly through their federal consistency projects. Um, and then in the director's report later, I'll talk about um, fire clearance projects because we're kind of taking the same approach. And one of the approaches we're using there is to have the RCD develop a public works plan that they can submit directly to the Coastal Commission and eliminate the need for coastal permits. So um, your points are very well taken, but the current status of the regulations are very protective about all activities within sensitive habitats. And I think that's partly because there have been restoration projects that have gone wrong. And having some oversight over that to make sure that they're implemented correctly, um, I think it's been just part of this transition where we're probably ready to move to a more streamlined, um, expedited process. Just, just wanted to hear what, what you needed out of me. Yeah. I don't want to be picky, you know, because. That could be my nature if I allow it to happen. <laughs> so, well, now we we could have put it on consent and eliminated the need for you know questioning. But I think you know, given our calendar for today, and also um, given the opportunity to learn about this uh, type of activity, I thought it was a um, useful thing for us to have a discussion on it. Plus, I, I wanted to uh, give the RCD an opportunity to showcase their good work because we work closely with them on many restoration projects and it's uh, nice to see some success in their efforts. I mean, I, I'm all for showcasing, I'm all for educating. Those are great things, you know, but I looked overall uh, how much time and effort and materials it took get, to get here. I did a mental calculation in my head and that's lots of big bucks for something very small and very wanted and very necessary and met every little checkbox so we could throw at it. And I, you know, I would say, let's, how do we fast track that 
unless they want to showcase it. And that was really, I guess, my question. So thank you. I got my answer. I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions, but I think they're better directed at the applicant. Um, does the applicant have a presentation at this point? Yes. Have 15 minutes on the on the call. Hi, Amy. Hi. Yes. Hi. This is Amy Kayser. I'm the project manager from the Resource Conservation District. Uh, I don't have a, a presentation to share, but I would like to just uh, respond to some of the comments and thank you all for reviewing uh, this project and to Mike and Steve for uh, putting together um, this document here. As uh, as you noted, it's it's very large, so um, I think that it covers all of our basis. Um, first, I want to note that the project is mutually beneficial to cattle and the, the listed species. Um, this was discussed a bit, but I want to really drive home that um, the, it, the improvements to grassland habitat are going to make things better for the endangered garter snake. And also it's going to provide more grazing habitat, so more grassland for the cattle to graze. Um, the benefits to the pond, um, this is a, a small stock water pond, and it has been uh, filling in um, with silt and erosion from the upland for many years. And so without intervention, um, the, the access uh, to water at this site for cattle would diminish. So we're creating longer term water access. And we've been working with the current grazing tenant to make sure that this the project uh, benefits the cattle as well. And um, with that, we have a, it's not for huge changes, but we do have a 30 year monitoring and maintenance period that's funded through PG&E. So we'll be monitoring the site um, yearly for the first few years, and then once every five years to make sure that the project is going as planned and that the benefits to the listed species and the cattle remain. Um, there will be some areas fenced around the pond um, uh, because there's, for the first couple of years, um, there's in that uh, design scheme that was shown, there's some uh, grading being done where we're scooping some material out of the pond, create a deep water pond, and all that excavated material is staying on site um, to create some benches and berms to create kind of the perfect habitat for the frog and snake. You know, they like a certain um, grade in the water uh, for, um, for being warm and then deep water to hide and then the basking benches. So anyways, there's gonna be some exposed soil that we're restoring. And we wanna make sure that that area has time to establish so that this the soil doesn't just move right back in, for example. And that's temporary fencing. And then we, um, we may work with uh, different types of fencing to, um, you know, to direct cattle at different times of year. But right now we're thinking that in the long term, um, the site will be, be fine without too much intervention. And as Mike mentioned, there's also some opportunities to um, pump water to troughs uh, so that there's, there's maintained um, water down there as well. Um, and, then, and then finally, I just want to mention is you know, very unlikely that, that cattle are going to trample the snake. We're not worried about that at all. We're more worried about um, you know, vehicular access. The cattle move pretty slow, so the snake usually has time to get out of the way. Um, but we're really excited about this project. It's a great um, benefit to the snake in this area as well as, as the frog. So um, we're excited to see a project that is so good for uh, recovery of these species as well as uh, supporting local operations like the cattle grazing. Uh, so thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Ramirez. Uh, yes, uh, question. Um, how many heads of cattle um, would you say that uh, are going to grace the area or normally would grace that, uh, the, the area in general? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know the, the limits that the landowner has on number of cattle. I think there's currently a couple of dozen, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Okay. So are the cattle going to be allowed to go and drink directly from, from the edge of the ponds around there? Yeah, currently they'll have um, access in the first year still to the southern end of the pond where work is not taking place. 
Um, and then hopefully after the vegetation is established on the north side, we'll have access to the full pond. If there is any issues with, um, with access, we do have some reserve funding to pump to troughs. I see. Okay, so you think a couple of dozen is the maximum? Um, I really, I, I uh, honestly, I, I don't really know. Um, I don't, I'm okay. not sure. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I, I do have, you know, in the discussions, we'll go into it, but I do have some concerns about, you know, the number of cattle uh, that would congregate around the ponds. Um, anyway, that, that's all the questions for the moment. Uh, Commissioner Santa Cruz. Uh, no questions so far. Commissioner Gupta. Uh, yes, um, I do have questions. Follow, uh, follow on to Commissioner Ramirez's question. Um, are these cattle uh, brought in to graze or they, they live on the property or parcel? Um, the, the cattle are currently there, they're grazing, yes, um, they might be taken on and off, it really depends on who the tenant is and what their agreement is with the landowner, and so we're not really involved in that aspect of the, of the site. I see, I see. So, uh, just, just for my own clarification, so it's not like sometimes um, go, goats are brought in to uh, clean up or uh, graze? Gotcha. Not, that not, that I'm a, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, uh, that's good. Uh, one more thing I, uh, I'm curious about is, what is the project schedule like? Yes, we are hoping to go to construction this summer. Um, this so this, summer? Yeah, we're, this is a, a timely meeting. Um, okay. We got delay, delayed last year uh, due to COVID. So um, there are some, there's a fair number of restrictions that we have on timing due to the species and the fact that we're working in water. So right. we're hoping to start in, in mid-summer and do the bulk of our work in um, August through early October. Okay. And um, it, uh, if all goes well by October, it would be done? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Commissioner Hanson. Morning, Amy. I've got a, one question is, uh, what's your estimated cost for the project? It's, an, it's nearly a million dollars in total for, for the construction and then the 30 years of monitoring and maintenance. Oh. Did I miss something? I, I'm, oh, sorry, can you hear me? My, I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing at the moment, so I may gotcha. have a response. Yeah, it's uh, it's nearly $1 million, a million for, dollars. for yeah. the total of permitting construction and then 30 years of monitoring and maintenance. Okay. Uh, what was your overhead cost to getting to this point? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can, okay. I can pull up. I just wanted to that. Just curious, I just didn't want the base cost of getting a couple of ponds and burns in to be uh, less than the overhead to get here. It's just a point I wanted to make. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions. So my, my question is uh, just curious, how does the process work for PG&E in this case to connect with agencies or landowners for habitat mitigation? Uh, I mean, was they doing a project, they have to mitigate that somewhere? Did there a list of possibilities that they can look up and they found you or the other way around? How yeah, that's a good question. And in this case, um, so PG&E, when they do a project, just like we have to go through a permitting process, they do as well. And so as part of their permitting process with the federal government, um, they were connected with US Fish and Wildlife Service for their mitigation requirements. And Fish and Wildlife Service knows the RCD and the type of work that we do in this area. So they recommended that PG&E connect with us for uh, mitigation. 
And we, um, US Fish and Wildlife Life Service makes this connection with a few different entities um, to the RCD when it's a project that they think the RCD might take on that's you know some sort of public good. Um, and so we had already identified this uh, habitat improvement project and we're able to offer it to the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service as a mitigation op opportunity and they accepted it. Um, so it can happen in a number of ways, but typically it's the um, it's the agency that connects um, the the other applicant, the initial construction applicant, with the RCD. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say while you're here, um, I really appreciate reading these kind of staff reports and the detail that's there. I know it must be a headache to prepare it all, but I just found it very interesting. Uh, so. Uh, especially Mark Hilkema's history of the Native Americans and all that. Uh, anyway, so now we'll move on to uh, public comment and I'll turn this portion over to Ms. Lujan. Thank you, Chair. We're now opening public comment for this item. If your hand is raised, your name will be called. I will lower your hand after you speak. Um, by those joining by telephone, please press star nine and Right now, I don't see any hands raised, um, Chair, but we're going to give it a couple seconds. Seeing none, there isn't. Okay, seeing that no members of the public wish to speak, uh, public comment on this item is now closed. Does, um, let's see, so now we'll move on to Commissioner comments and deliberation, and we'll start with Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, uh, Chair. Chairwoman. Um, yeah, so just to kind of uh, follow up on, you know, the questioning that I was doing. Um, I am concerned about the number of cattle. Uh, it would be nice to actually understand, you know, what it what that looks like. Uh, because I think that uh, if it's, if it's, if there are too many, um, it may actually overwhelm uh, the area and trample some of these animals. So uh, I almost wish that there was an exclusion area right at the pond so that, you know, that wouldn't happen. I think in the rest of the grazing areas, I mean, it's great that, you know, um, this will enhance also for more grass to grow so that the cattle have more areas to graze, and, you know, be better overall for, for the cattle and the business, I guess. Um, but the concern for me is that uh, I, I would like to know, you know, how many cattle, because I, I grew up actually, you know, in the cattle uh, business since when I was small and part of my job was actually to make sure that the cattle would not overgraze in one area and always move them, keep, keep them moving. And uh, while we're talking about, you know, naturally we had other animals that, that would take care of that you know, uh, uh, elk or whatever else. But I, I think normally those those type of animals, they, they wouldn't stand around for very long times. You know, they grace one area and then they move on. Um, and with cattle, as you're grazing, and the, if there's no one there uh, to move them along, they can spend too much time in one area. Um, and uh, in this case, I mean, the most important aspect of this project has to be the protection of this protective species. So anything that we can do to make sure that they don't get harassed, trampled, uh, things like that, it's at the most, uh, you know, the most important thing that, that we should be looking at. But overall, I would say, yes, I do support uh, the project because I think it's great that uh, we're enhancing um, you know, the, the, the area for the natural um, habitat of these animals. So I think it's, uh, it's nice, it's good to see that. And I would uh, also have a little bit of disagreement with uh, Commissioner Hansen. I love reading this uh, reports, especially for the historical facts. And I think if it wasn't for this, I mean, to me, this is a, a total educational uh, aspect that uh, we I receive every time I read these reports, and I really like it. <laughs> so, um, but I, I agree. I mean, I think um, they should probably be 
uh, fast track and, and, and move so that there's more of them done rather than uh, taking too long to get them done. So that's my take on this. Thank you. Commissioner Santa Cruz. Um, I just have a question for the applicant. The, um, if the Peninsula Open Space Trust is the responsible <laughs> for this project and Commissioner Hansen asked the question and how much is the budget for the construction of this, which is about a million, where is this money coming from? Yeah, so uh, the RCD is responsible for the 30 year maintenance and monitoring period of this particular project. Uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust would be, you know, is responsible for managing their entire site. Um, but through this mitigation agreement, it's the RCD that's responsible for that 30 year maintenance and monitoring period. And the funding has come through PG&E through that mitigation. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner. Commissioner Gupta. Um, I too have just one quick question for the applicant. Um, and that question is that uh, this is a small area of the total parcel that uh, is going to be enhanced. Is that correct? The total project area is 65 acres. And so we are doing enhancements uh, on about 61 acres of the upland for vegetation management. And then we're doing these about, you know, um, an, the acre of pond and surrounding wetland area. So in total, it's a 65 acre project area. Oh, okay. Okay. So the entire, uh, or most of the area is uh, going to be uh, worked upon. Um, that's, that's okay. So, so is there is there any uh, agricultural uh, activity taking place on this at all? And not within the the project area. No, there is some not adjacent properties that. with agriculture, though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is just for my clarification. Thank you. Uh, so, my uh, the way I'm looking at this project is, I think. It's a very um, good project. And uh, yes, it should be fast tracked, uh, but I'm not familiar with, with the processes that take place. So, uh, so and, and I'm very happy to hear that before the end of the year, this, this could be done if all goes uh, as planned uh, there. And I really looked at uh, the report and I was impressed how, how well documented it is and how uh, the, the thing that really caught my eye was that, that the workers would be trained because not everybody understands uh, the requirements on these kind of projects, that all workers would be trained before uh, they start the construction. I think that's a that's a wonderful idea, and uh, it should be done in other projects too. But uh, how detailed it was, uh, I like that, and and I think it's a very good project. I support the project. So thank you, Commissioner Hansen. Um, I support the project. Uh, again, I want to thank. Uh, the work that was done to bring it forward to us. Like I said, the, the information in there I've used elsewhere. It is extremely well documented, so thank you. Uh, my Again, my reasonings of making a point about fast tracking is this is a lot of money and I wanna do more of this and I wanna see ha it happen sooner. That's my only objective it is like we're putting a development where we remove resources, we're enhancing resources. It's at the other end of the spectrum that we normally don't get to. And I don't wanna take time or money away that would, would allow us to make that envelope bigger. So um, I'm in agreement with like what everything Commissioner Ramirez said. It's, uh, you know, the, 
there are valuable questions to be asked and things like that. And at the same time, everything comes at a cost, both time and money that can be applied to what we consider at the other end of the very beneficial side. And I just don't want to delay or minimize that. So uh, you'll have my support. Please get to it. I love the education part of this. And, and again, the, the cultural section in that was so much fun to read. Uh, and I will use again. Okay, should we just do a motion then? Oh, wait, my, my turn, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, I support the project as well. And I, I, I think to the question of how many head of, head of cattle, it's, um, it's this term conservation grazing that we've seen other projects like uh, recently the Toto Ranch project where uh, basically weather, all kinds of conditions to consider and then as to whether they bring cattle in, how many to bring in when they move them off that um, with post as owner, I'm sure this is that same concept. So I'm confident that um, that will be monitored and uh, so now, uh, may I have a motion for approval? Okay, I have a motion to approve the coastal development permit, county file number PLN 2021-00010 by adopting the required finding and condition of approval identifying attachment A of your staff report. We have a motion, oh, may I have a second? Second. We have a motion in the second, roll call please. Commissioner Gupta. Aye. Mr. Santa Cruz? Aye. Mr. Hansen? Aye. Mr. Ramirez? Aye. Mr. Ketchum? Aye. Motion passes. Motion is approved five to zero. Uh, now we'll move on to the director's portion of the meeting. Thank you, Chair Ketchum, and good morning, commissioners. Um, I have no correspondence to report to you today. And with regard to the next meeting, um, we don't have any study session planned. And at this moment, we do not have any items on the agenda. So there is the potential cancellation of our next meeting. Um, more to come on that. Um, moving on to the director's report, um, as you probably heard today, San Mateo County entered the yellow tier. And so that's uh, good news for county businesses. And um, the uh, county manager has announced to county staff that um, he intends to follow suit with the um, state in terms of uh, achieving a reopening by June 15th. So re reopening of the county um, office buildings. Um, so we're putting together a reopening plan. Um, I'll be meeting with uh, all department staff this afternoon to talk about our plans. I anticipate it's going to be a hybrid approach um, where we'll have fewer people in the office and expanded telecommute programs. I think um, some of our office hours will be limited. Um, as you might recall, we have built a customer service window that allows transactions to occur with the customer being outside and staff being inside under a covered awning. So we intend to continue to make use of that. And we're contemplating limiting um, public visits up to the second floor based on an appointment system, not only uh, for our protection, but to prevent um, the gathering of cattle. Um, <laughs> Sorry to make a joke on <laughs> the other item, but the image, I couldn't resist the image came to mind. Um, no, we want to keep the numbers low and we don't want, you know, a big group of folks in the waiting area at once. So if we go by appointment system, I think that will help control that. So um, okay. still under development. Um, I really want to work closely with my staff so that um, we do this in a way that is going to be safe and effective. But it, I think it's very exciting news and I'll be happy when um, I'll get to see you all in person. 
Um, in that regard, you know, more to come on the um, format of public meetings. Um, I'm still waiting to hear kind of what the Board of Supervisors will be doing, and I will do my best to keep you informed and we can work together on how we want to uh, reinitiate uh, meetings in person. Um, and so just in time for the June 15th opening, I'm pleased to announce that we will have a new building official. So we've been without a building official for over a year now. It's been a real strain on the staff. Um, and so um, his name is Fred Lustenberger. He comes from the city of Rockland near Sacramento and um, he will begin June 7th. So I'm um, very excited to welcome him to our team. Uh, you don't often hear from our building official, right? Um, the Planning Commission makes decisions on discretionary permits like coastal development permits, grading permits, design review permits. Once those decisions are made, then applicants go to the building section to pull their, pull their construction permits. So the building in official is in charge of all that, um, making sure that the building permits are processed efficiently, that the inspections are occurring as they should, and that um, we're providing the best customer service possible to those folks who need to pull those permits. So um, it's a key position and um, it will be a great asset to the county to have that filled. Um, uh, Something is going to the Coastal Commission on Friday that the commission uh, might be interested in, and that's the coastal development uh, permit for the Marotta Road bridge replacement. The Marotta Road bridge is a key link in the California Coastal Trail. Um, it's just south of the, um, the uh, community of El Granada right there on the coast where Arroyo de Enmedio enters the ocean. Um, the abutments of the old bridge had undermined, and I believe there was um, some disintegration of the supporting braces. So um, we, the Department of Public Works has worked very closely with Coastal Commission staff to address the impacts of the bridge replacement project. And um, we have a positive recommendation from the staff on that. Um, however, there continues to be some opposition um, from uh, members of the public who believe that um, the public's best interest would be served by moving the bridge inland in light of um, climate change, coastal erosion, and um, you know, I don't think the county disagrees that that is something that is going to may need to be looked at in the future. But in terms of uh, reestablishing this critical link in the coastal trail and doing it in, in a timely manner, um, we're hoping to get Coastal Commission approval of this permit. And that's going to be on Friday, probably around noontime. If you're interested in tuning in, it's hard to predict when it uh, will come up. but. Um, for those who, of you who haven't observed a Coastal Commission meeting, um, they're pretty much always interesting and worth tuning into, so it um, might be worth watching. Um, I mentioned there is a bunch of fire clearance project efforts underway, um, including the Resource Conservation District's um, attempt to get a public works plan approved by the Coastal Commission, which would exempt these projects from having to come to you for a coastal development permit, if that's successful. So we've been working closely with the RCD, the Coastal Commission, as well as Santa Cruz County. This is a partnership with Santa Cruz County RCD. And um, I think this will go a long way in addressing some of um, the management needs of our forests. Um, we're also partnering, partnering closely with uh, CAL FIRE on our tree ordinance update. As you know, we've been working um, for a couple of years now on updating our significant inherited tree regulations. And um, the first phase of that effort was very focused on protecting um, the significant oaks, particularly in the Menlo Oaks area. And um, we feel like we've uh, got a good draft in that regard. Now we're um, turning back to 
fire clearance needs and the need to expedite and exempt some of these projects so that they can occur in, um, as uh, Fred, uh, Commissioner Hansen mentioned, you know, in an expeditious way that it doesn't cost extra time and money because they need to be done now. So we're doing what we can to facilitate that. And then finally, just an update on board items. Um, coming up at the next Tuesday's board meeting will be an appeal of the um, after the fact permit to remove the tree at 10 Cardinal Court. So you'll recall the large tree that was removed without a permit at, in the dead of night during the rain. Um, and we brought an after the fact permit to the commission that included mitigation for the loss of that tree. Um, the planning commission's approval of that permit has been appealed to the board of supervisors. So we'll be hearing that appeal on Tuesday. And then the other item, um, which was continued from the board meeting on uh, May 4th is the general plan amendment and zoning amendment for the Sequoia tract. Um, that got pushed out because at the last board meeting, um, we had a tremendous number of public comments uh, that weren't fully anticipated, at least by me. Um, and it was focused on the concern about the expiration of the moratorium on eviction. So uh, large numbers of the public came to speak to the board about applying pressure to the state to extend that moratorium. And if the state doesn't do it, they'd like to see the county take action. So um, due to timing impacts from that, we got postponed, but um, it will be coming up next Tuesday. Finally, uh, also at the last board meeting, the uh, Board of Supervisors did approve the child care ordinance. So that will take effect um, outside the coastal zone within 30 days of that action. And we'll be submitting an LCP amendment package to the Coastal Commission for, uh, so it can take effect in the coastal zone after it's certified by the commission. So that concludes my director's report and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I had a question, Steve, on uh, your kiosk. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, the kiosk is, uh, is built so people don't have to go inside, applicants don't have to go inside. So is, uh, is there just one person kiosk, like, or uh, there are multiple counters type of thing? Typically, um, there's been one or two, there are one. two workstations and it's large enough that I would say you could safely have three to four people in that room. Um, it was built as a um, shared project by planning and building and revenue services. Revenue services, um, you know, collects payments and many people like to make those payments by cash. So they need to figure out a way to enable that. So we were splitting our use of that window. Um, Revenue Services has a similar window inside the building on the first floor. So once the building opens, that customer service window is no longer needed by Revenue Services and planning and building can, um, I, hope I need to, still need to work this out, uh, have more time in that. And um, it's very easy for the receptionist at that window to call up to the second floor to have a planner or a permit technician come down to provide assistance. So while okay. there is, you know, we rely on the receptionist, there will be other staff that will be able to come down and serve our customers. That, that's a good plan. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Steve or uh, comments from commissioners? Seeing no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all. Right. all. Thank See you, guys. Thank you. See you, ne see you next uh, meeting. Have a, have a